Welcome to this episode of ClearedCast, your source for security clearance, intelligence community, espionage, national security, and defense contracting updates, and our exclusive interviews with intelligence community and government leaders. First, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by ClearanceJobs.com. Clearance Jobs connects security clearance professionals and employers in a secure and private platform to fill the jobs that safeguard our nation. Their protected career marketplace allows industry employers and candidates to connect, converse, and exchange career opportunities. From live chat and instant messaging to live voice communication and deep personal and company branding, Clearance Jobs balances participation and security. Learn more at www.clearancejobs.com. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of ClearedCast. I'm Katie Keller. I'm the Editorial Communications Manager with Clearance Jobs. And today I'm joined by John Davis, who is a retired U.S. Army counterintelligence officer, civil servant, and a linguist. Currently in retirement, you write essays on counterintelligence, OPSEC, and security issues for clearancejobs.com. So thank you so much for joining me today, John. Well, thank you, Katie. Glad to be here. My first question. When did you first get interested in sort of this secret world? When I came into the military, I was in combat arms. I was an artillery officer. I was commissioned out of Washington University in St. Louis. But when I came into the military, I took a test on several things, and one of which was language capability. Upon my completion of my mandatory four years at uh, Fort Campbell, to pay back for my ROTC scholarship, I was contacted by the branch who said, hey, we see here that you're a linguist. And I said, yeah, I I kept current with Spanish throughout high school. And he said, well, how about college? I said, yeah, I followed up with that as well. And he said, would you like to go to Defense Language Institute, learn German, and then go on into uh, counterintelligence? And that intrigued me. And I stayed with them 37 years after that. I figured today with your, you have such a wealth of experience on uh, OPSEC. You mentioned that you were the counterintelligence point of contact for major commands, facility security officers and had installations around the world. And you also taught Department of Army OPSEC course for 10 years. And you mentioned that that became the model for other places. So what are some key OPSEC principles that are important for anyone working in the national security world today? I would say if somebody found themselves responsible for any classified program, they need to be equally familiar with the principles of OPSEC. Having taught it for so long, I can sort of rattle them off. (laughs) There's five steps, and I can elaborate on those, but I think it's important to know the five OPSEC principles that basically, in layman's terms, you identify what is critical to your program. In other words, if you lost it or somebody stole it, your whole program is over. Who's out to get it? That's actually the part I taught. I taught the threat portion, which was step two of the OPSEC uh, process. Who's out to get it? Is it a country? And, I, and you'll notice in many of my articles, I always say adversaries because it's not necessarily an adversary. In fact, in, under OPSEC, what we found so phenomenal and what actually created the program during the Vietnam War was everybody would see that something was missing or somebody had been tipped off about an Army activity or an Air Force activity, what have you, and they thought, oh, my God, we've got spies. Well, it turned out, It wasn't espionage. We were giving it away ourselves unwittingly. So we talk about the threat assessment, and I always went on to how to get the best threat assessments that covers the most areas and so forth. I talk about this periodically in the articles I write for uh, clearance jobs. Then there's the vulnerability analysis, and that's pretty easy. You just look at what are we doing? What's the threat? Where are we vulnerable? Then you to make a risk assessment. In other words, you're not trying to completely block all risk. That is almost prohibitive. You can't live in a world where you're totally safeguarded from everything. I mean, we see this in the pandemic, but you make a risk assessment. You try to decide, okay, what can I do to complete my mission without risking the entire compromise of the program? And then lastly, 
you apply appropriate OPSEC measures and countermeasures. Okay, how do I protect something? For example, an incident that happened overseas, a lot of Americans were on a van that took them from their embassy job to their homes. The van was blocked in on a side street. Machine gunners arose from various windows from the two blocking walls of buildings on either side, opened fired and killed them in this van. So everybody was starting to look, oh my God, we've got spies everywhere. How did was this compromise? Well, it turned out that the van program was posted on a bulletin board for anybody who passed by to see. That was an OPSEC compromise that cost lives. And it's those kinds of things that we teach people how to avoid. And there are whole regulations. Now there's whole uh, organizations dedicated to this on how to protect such things. I always try to take one aspect of any organization and you decide, well, what are we trying to protect? Is it a thing? For example, are you protecting a single component on a tank or is it the entire tank? Well, if you decide that the critical information is actually a small component that you can lock in a safe, so much the better. You saved your company lots of money from having to protect a massive vehicle, for example. Or you can say it's a process and you don't want your adversary, be it another country or another company, you know, who wants to sell a final product to the government. You always have to keep in mind what is critical to the success of my mission, which means it's sort of like an old proverb that I learned years ago in some management course where they say, date the problem. If you can do that, you're on your way to solving your uh, OPSEC concerns. Sure. That is a great point. Taking a look at what is important to you or your company or your government, whatever entity we're talking about here, is it a piece of information? Are the OPSEC principles or safeguards that you're putting in place, do they have more to do with the cyber realm or is it a person like that example, the van of embassy workers overseas? What's maybe an OPSEC principle or a threat, since that's what you disclosed you focused on, That isn't really a usual suspect that folks might forget about or realize that they're sort of doing it wrong. One of the simplest things, believe it or not, is one of the easiest compromises that companies make. I don't know how many people know this, but as soon as you put the trash out by your building, it is in the public domain. We used to watch old movies about the FBI guys going through mafia trash cans. Well, that actually is a common technique to steal your information. I bring it up because one of the first cases I ever worked was a trash collector was paid $500 a month to bring the trash from a government building to a location where he left it in bags and walked away. That turned out to be one of the most lucrative collection techniques, but in this case, it was an adversary government. But If you think about what it is that you work on, how many thousands of documents do you generate? And then you follow those documents from creation to use to distribution, okay? And distribution is critical. And then to final destruction. And we found out that, for example, when a person left the command, someone would get not pleasant job to go and empty the guy's desk out. So the guy goes, empties out the desk, throws piles of stuff into a trash can, and that would go out with the regular trash. And the next thing you know, that trash would be in the dumpster. What I did as a countermeasure when I was uh, working for this major command was I briefed all of our cleaning team. And I said, if you find out anything in our trash that's being thrown out, that's got any of these symbols on it. And I showed them, obviously classified, but also F-O-U-O and things of this sort. And you bring it to me, I encourage them greatly to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, the first guy that brought it, (laughs) it was shocking. He brought something that said, eyes only sealed by a federal court. And I thought, oh my God, that was in the trash. (laughs) It was in the trash. Within a month, 
another guy brought another one in there, and it's that eyes only commanding general. Well, believe it or not, with that document in hand, we went to see the general, who almost went apoplectic. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, my God, where did this end up? You know, thinking some dark enemy country. Mm -hmm. We said, your trash cans were emptied, and that was in it. And the guy almost had a heart attack. Well, the happy news is we began a serious control of all of our trash going out, a huge shredding campaign, which uh, resulted in a new practices, actually a new policy. But the best news of all for me was we got a massive bonus for both of the young janitors who reported those. And they, they were happy, you know, to beat the band. And that created yet more. I always look at it this way. We in the classified world tend to think we live in a rarefied atmosphere where we know and other people don't. And for the most part, that's quite true. But the other people that don't are quite often targeted by adversaries because they're known as shoehorns. That's an actual term that uh, is used because they can tell somebody who does have access, who is having problems and things of this sort. And they're all quite often approached to reveal things like that. You bring up the trash. That's an excellent example. It's so simple, but it does. I don't I'm not sure that it was you, but on the, the news site recently, we did talk about how employees are still a company's biggest threat sometimes just for that reason. Yes, we have to be cognizant of our recruiting techniques. Of course, one of the things that I always proposed and that we did as a conscious effort was in order to make somebody loyal or to have a feeling of loyalty, they have to feel a part of the team. And I think we all agree to that. I mean, that is almost a human nature statement. And a way to make people feel a part of something is don't leave them out when you're giving briefings. For example, we would give the annual classified briefing to all of our personnel regarding don't compromise things. This is the current classified threat and things of this sort. But what I always made a point of doing was giving an unclassified briefing to all of our personnel. And this, I believe it or not, we had to go through their company to make sure that this was paid time off for them to attend a briefing like this. But I have to say, later on, when we went back and showed what was saved in terms of money invested and things like this, as a result of giving these kinds of briefings, it was astronomical. They would maybe get a couple thousand dollars bonus for their reports. But we literally were saving millions, not only in protected classified information, but in potential lawsuits, because quite often companies need to be cognizant of that as well. And that's why whenever we set up a program, we made sure that everybody was included. And oftentimes, I, you know, I can add a subset to this. One of the things that I did in the course of establishing policy. And when I say policy, it was, you know, we had to base ours on big armies policy, but we also had many, many bases around the world in foreign countries. And we had to also be cognizant of threats that change, obviously, over in other countries when our people either travel there or are stationed there. And if I may, can I add one other major program that we implemented, which was extremely valuable? Would that be all right? Yes, absolutely. It was our foreign travel briefing program. If any of our people went overseas, they were required to receive a classified foreign travel briefing program. But the interesting part of this is it wasn't all classified. We established a method whereby they would get a tailored briefing. And I, use, I would always come back to this term, a tailored briefing. In other words, you wouldn't get like, okay, we're having 17 people travel this month, and you kill all 17 briefings in one canned briefing. That is, that's almost wasting t their time and yours. What we would do was spend the time to find out what is the threat in each given country. 
Some of the places were far more dangerous than others. And obviously, we had the classified portion. But in terms of OPSEC, we made sure that they knew where potential compromises had happened in the past, the types of things that they need to be aware of. For example, a lot of hotels overseas are wired for sound. In other words, if you go in there, you are usually assigned a room that is surveilled by video and audio. And those are the kinds of things that we would brief people on so that they were aware that, you know, this isn't going to uh, Des Moines, Iowa this time around. You know, this is a foreign country. We also concentrated on briefing people on the methodology of surviving a terrorist attack. And this was primarily uh, for people who were going to countries where that was a significant threat, uh, sometimes more so than others. Because we would have, for example, one young lady who uh, we saw to it was recognized for her work. We briefed her on how to be cognizant of an incident because in her travels, if I recall, it was uh, London. One of the techniques back during one of the bombing campaigns back in the early 2000s, I believe it was, they would set off a bomb on a subway station. People would flee the station and then go immediately to public affairs, uh, public transportation up above. And they would set off a secondary bomb up there. And so we brief people on that. And we like to think, particularly in the way that the lady reported this, that we were able to save lives that way. Uh, because of one particular incident that she found herself involved in. We told her how to react, where to go, how to keep people posted. So pre-travel briefings are always important, as well as post-travel briefing. This way, if a person reports strange contacts, unusual things, they may not even be aware that they've been approached. But if in their post-travel brief debriefing, they talk about something that needs following up on, you can do that. And now a message from this episode's sponsor. Do you ever find as a recruiter that there are not enough hours in the day and wish your most tedious processes could be pre-programmed? Introducing Clearance Jobs Workflow, the most important recruiting invention since the classifieds. This tool communicates with candidates for you as a working robo-assistant, completing predetermined tasks that you usually do manually. It works on the if-then principle. If a candidate does this, then workflow will do this. So set your target audience, identify the action candidates take like logging in or activating their profile, and choose if you want workflow to connect with them, tag them, or message that candidate. Learn more about the endless possibilities of workflow at about.clearancejobs.com. Well, I'm happy that you mentioned, you know, with this type of briefing or training, it is tailored and you know, almost a waste of time if it's not. So I guess just, you know, OPSEC training in general, or even foreign travel training, how has all of this changed over time, in your opinion? Well, obviously, the big new threat is computers. There are massive amounts of computer threats out there, ranging everywhere from obviously very sophisticated national threats, such as what the Russians have in a uh, organization whose acronym is IRA. They're the ones behind, uh, I believe, the, ac the nickname is like Cozy Bear and so forth. We read about those a lot in the paper. There are other threats that are far more devastating in the, in the near term. And those are done by 17-year-old kids. We find uh, recently one was arrested who uh, conducted a uh, computer ransomware attack. We've, in fact, locally here, one whole city was just closed down because their city computers were held to ransom. So there's a whole host of those that are out there that people need to be cognizant of. But I always tell our travelers, especially, I said, you know, one thing you can do is the karate kid approach. And they said, what's that? And I said, the best defense is don't be there. And they go, what? And I said, yeah. I said, if you don't need a computer, don't bring it. And I know telling people these days, if you 
go on a foreign travel and you don't have a computer, they feel like you've asked them to lop off their arm or something. Mm -hmm. But the reason I say that is because we find that often when our travelers would go overseas, they would not be aware of just how vulnerable they are really becoming in even more of a way than here in the United States. And so as a result, what we would do is we would see to it that when they traveled, they had a completely clean computer. They didn't take their personal laptop. They wouldn't have all of their links available. But when they traveled, they would be able to travel with something that was less easily compromised, we'll say. So computers is an area for which I could, if I can, can I veer off a little bit to what I also advise to uh, facility security officers that we dealt with. We would always say, guys, if you have a company that has a lot of security requirements, you can't do it all yourself. And this, I would literally start out any of my briefings with them with. I would say, you have two eyes, but your company has twice as many eyes as you have people. You've got to enlist them on your side. Make them conscious of the mottos and the principles that you go by. Make it simple for people to understand. When you talk about the two-person rule, in other words, only make your extremely serious information accessible only when two people can have access to it. When also you say the motto, need to know. In other words, don't talk about something with somebody without a need to know. But another way to multiply your eyes in defending your company is when you say, I can, I know the people to reach out to when I don't know the answer. And you have a huge number of people in your area where your company is located, you can go, and I would always recommend to all company security managers, I always tell them, guys, go to the FBI. Go to the 902nd Military Intelligence if you're working a uh, military program. Go to the Defense Security Service guys. If you're overseas, know who the embassy security officer is. Meet these people. See what they can do for you. You'd be amazed what is out there and what capabilities exist for you as a uh, security manager. There are there are experts out there that you would you could if you don't feel confident giving an OPSEC briefing, they'll point you to the guy in town who can give a bang up OPSEC briefing for your people and show you ways that you can follow up by giving tailor briefings, not to the whole company, but if one guy in one in one area of your company is working on a project, how to give them this OPSEC briefing, how to give them an OPSEC assessment. If another guy is working on a process in another part of your company, how to give them a tailor brief. These are all things that you can offer to the people that you support. For all, all great points, uh, specifically for FSOs. But you did recently write an article a few weeks ago that I think really applies to our entire cleared cast audience, my friend, the spy, why espionage is still an inside job. And yes. again, you had a ton of important points in there, uh, really how clearance holders need to constantly be mindful of potential threats. Yes. And so along with being wary of those strangers with listening ears, I think you listed it out as what other advice would you offer folks to ward off um, spy recruiters? Maybe that aren't necessarily traveling in other places. Um, so just, you know, the average Joe and I guess Jill. Yeah. The average Joe and Jill should be aware that most espionage today, and this information is as old as I think this week, I think the FBI just came out with a new uh, assessment. The, in, the insider is the threat. How does this insider operate? I always uh, 
use an acronym that we used many, many times, which was money, ideology, compromise, and ego. These were the four basic areas where a person could be approached by an outsider. If a guy in your company has lost his, a ton of money, if he is facing a divorce, if he has all kinds of crises in his life that you may not be aware of, if an adversary finds out about it, this could be a very lucrative way for this adversary to feel him out to see if he can be recruited to steal your secrets for him to pay for. This is unfortunately in the United States when uh, an assessment was made some time back about what is it that Americans usually spy for? The answer is money. Americans tend to steal for money. Many years ago, and this is a significant change, many years ago, that was not always the case. There was a famous couple that was arrested, I think it was in the like 2014 period of time. It was a couple, I think their last name was Myers. Anyway, they had been stealing for the Cuban communists for 30 years. They were ideological spies. In other words, they spied not for money, but because they believed in the principles that uh, Fidel Castro proposed back in the 50s and 60s. So that particular aspect is not as prevalent anymore. but espionage by the insider certainly is. A lot of times there's what's called the false flag approach. Many times companies will find that their people have been approached and they think it's by another company, so they don't report the approach to the FBI. And the reason is, is because they think, well, we can handle all this inside. This has nothing to do with foreign governments. But it turns out later that the person they thought was an espionage agent from a foreign company was actually working for a foreign government. This is why I always end every briefing I've ever had with anybody with, if you feel uneasy about something, don't investigate yourself, report it. And who do you report it to? If you feel confident reporting it to your security manager, go to him. And then presumably he will know which official government agency to then report it to. If you don't feel confident with your security manager, you're authorized to go straight to a uh, government agency. And that's why a lot of times private citizens will go straight to the FBI. And that's perfectly legitimate. One of the pitfalls in private companies that we've noticed is a lot of people don't want to report that they had a computer attack, let's say, that was a denial of service attack where somebody puts them offline for hours at a time. They don't report that. Why? Because they think their shareholders will lose confidence in them. And I tell people, guys, report it. The FBI, the 902nd, all these agencies are not there to cause your business harm. They're there to stop these kinds of attacks in the first place. Always think in the long term for the protection of not only, obviously, your company, but also the well-being of the country and the things that we believe are important enough to uh, classify. Sure, big picture. Um, so moving on to our last topic, after the Cold War and that's aftermath, you wrote Rainy Street Stories, Reflections on Secret Wars, Terrorism and Espionage talking about the true events and also the moral aspects of the secret world. And then you also have Around the Corner, that publication. Tell me a little bit about those books. And then if you do have an excerpt from those, we'd love to hear that. Upon retirement, I was in a, a large auditorium and several colleagues were coming by to wish me well and so forth. And one colleague came up to me and he said, you know, I've followed your writing over the years. And I thought, you know, it was your typical good for you, have a happy retirement. And he says, you know, if you ever think about writing a book, I'll publish it. Well, you could have knocked me down with a feather. Sure. And so I did. I collated many of the stories that I'd written for innumerable journals on many of the topics we've talked about here, but in a lot more detail, of course. 
and citing actual instances, put them together, and nobody is more surprised than me by how much uh, this has actually caught the attention of a lot of people who want to know about what it is that we do in the secret world or have done. I had to, of course, go through the uh, proper steps with the government itself, which, by the way, is another aspect of a good security manager is that you have a good public release policy, but that, that's a separate topic. <laughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to illustrate the kinds of writing that I collated in, um, well, here, for example, in Rainy Street Stories. I have a friend who is a professional magician. He lives in uh, Brooklyn. And he and I would talk about many, many things. And one time I said, well, are there any principles of magic? And he says, sure. And, you know, and I thought he was going to launch into some long uh, essay. But mm -hmm. actually, they're simple. One is disappearance, appearance, transposition of objects, physical change in an object, apparent defiance of natural law, invisible sources of motion, and mental phenomenon. And I said, that's it? And he says, yeah, all magic is based on those principles. And I suddenly realized, I said, well, that's principle of deception in any case. And I could launch into uh, a new phenomenon that we have today, such as disinformation, which I write in some great detail about in my various books. But just to give a couple of examples, one of the uh, greatest deception operations was simply playing on the belief that one side system was not able to be penetrated at all by the other side. We all know the famous uh, story of uh, the Enigma secret, which was so well protected that it was only finally revealed in 1974. But, for example, one German counterintelligence officer, granted he was working for the uh, other side in World War II, but I came to greatly admire what he did. He created Operation Nord Pole or North Pole, which was a method whereby they compromised a couple of secret agents dropped into Germany and the Netherlands at the beginning of World War II from England. They compromised them and they had them send back to England that all was well and we're getting all this intelligence and so forth. And they would send all of this. And the British hooked it up like in a pleasant rain. They were happy as clams that their spies were in country and properly reporting. And nobody stopped to check that the security note that they were supposed to leave out a certain word, for example, whenever they reported in, they never reported that. In other words, the spies were trying to tell them, we've been compromised. We're having to report what the Germans tell us to report because we're sitting in a jail in Den Haag in the Netherlands. People didn't believe it. And the reason they didn't believe it is because one of the principles of magic that was employed was they made people believe that their system was totally without flaw. They believed their system was so good that the very checks that they created in order to give warning that there was something dramatically wrong, they ignored. And I used these stories to sort of start a subsequent discussion of what do we do when we're security managers, when we are OPSEC officers, that we do it so regularly that we don't even look at the built-in protections that we've done ourselves. We have convinced ourselves that we are so good that we cease to believe that we may have made not only a mistake, but a critical mistake. And I go on and cite numerous examples of that. Well, for example, one, German pilots followed a beam, and this beam flew across the northern part of Europe into London, and they followed these beams religiously. Well, the Allies figured out that that was the only way that they could orient on their uh, target because radar was in its infancy. In those. They set an electrical beam on every target that they were going to 
destroy. Well, a great magician in England figured out what he would do would be to set up lights in a city to make it look as if the city was off this beam. In other words, he just put lights out in a huge field and made the pilots believe that they would were flying not in the direction of the actual city by staying on the beam and because the city was in blackout, they diverted over to bomb a bunch of empty fields because they were um, falsely guided. And I use stories like this to show that the deception of the mind is greater than the physical threat on the ground. And I use that by saying that this and just a, a simple extract. Let me read one paragraph. German bombers rumble relentlessly across the night sky of North Africa following a radio beam directed from German-occupied Libya toward the British part of Alexandria, Egypt. The flight commander notes an anomaly. The beam directs him forward, but he can see the lights of Alexandria to his left. The beam is known to be correct, but below him are city lights. Not only can he see the few inevitable lights in violation of blackout, he can easily see ship's lights in the harbor. He turns towards the lights and bombs nothing. That story, taken from World War II, is one that I then use to go into a multiple paragraph discussion of how deception in operations works. And these are not, as I always tell people, sort of like old bromides and canned stories from yesteryear. I take historical examples in order to give modern recommendations on how you can protect modern programs, even computer programs, by knowing the principles of deception, in other words, the principles of magic. So that's just one example from, oh, I'd say maybe a hundred stories in both of my uh, books. That, that's so great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So where can folks find your books? On Amazon. On Amazon. Uh, Amazon.com. And uh, if you look under John William Davis, Rainy Street Stories, you can find both of them because if you just scroll down, Around the Corner is also listed there because most of the people who bought the first, I'm gratified to say, went on to get the second. It certainly kept me busy. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, yes, I'm sure folks uh, are interested in reading more of those stories. That's extremely interesting. But before we close out, I do ask everyone this question. What was your favorite place that you were stationed and why? My favorite place to be stationed was the Netherlands, and it was in the near the city of Maastricht. And the reason that I liked it was because I loved the collegiality of working together with allies. I liked it that we all believed the basic principles of liberal democracy and what we stood for as Western nations defending the rule of law and our rights as citizens of free societies. And I also found it very interesting just to see the ways of other people and see that we can advance forward as free people by standing together and protecting what we believe to be good. That, that's lovely. I knew you were going to have a good one from all of your, you know, being a linguist, knowing all these languages and being so many places. So thank you so much for sharing that with me. Well, thank you, Katie, and thanks to all who have listened. This is Katie Keller, editor at clearancejobs.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of ClearedCast. For more information on career and recruiting advice, visit news.clearancejobs.com. This episode of ClearedCast is brought to you by Clearance Jobs, the largest career networking site for individuals with active federal clearances. For more information, visit www.clearancejobs.com.